a couple days ago as I watched Arthur Rehi's video on Russia's announcement of a partial mobilization. To be honest, it was very interesting to the extent where I agree with most of his points. But I fundamentally disagree with the conclusion, with the overall analysis. So this mobilization will not give any upper hand to Russia. However poorly trained they might be, 300,000 additional troops will make a difference on the battlefield. It's almost double from what Russia currently has. Without further ado, let's react to what he had to say. By the way, I'll try to keep this video short because I have to vote today. Being a good citizen, you know. Declaring mobilization is a sign of weakness. It means that the special military operation has failed and Russian leaders know it. Yes, correct. It became clear that the special military operation had failed within the first week. Ukraine resisted much more than Russia had anticipated. And the turning point was when the West flooded Ukraine with weapons and ammunition. Even worse, when they sent them heavy weapons and artillery. Essentially, it's a nightmare scenario for Russia and somehow the FSB did not anticipate any of this. From a military perspective, what's funny is that the moment that Ukraine mobilized its entire male population, Russia stood still. They laughed at these untrained conscripts sent into the trenches as cannon fodder and didn't think that an extra 700,000 men would make a difference. This is a perfect example of underestimating your opponent. Russian bloggers already called for mobilization in May when it became clear that a quick win in Ukraine was off the table. And many have correctly predicted that the Kremlin would only start mobilizing once the stick would be rotating painfully deep inside the bunda, aka now. He was always afraid of declaring mobilization because he knows history very well and in the last 150 years every bigger regime change in Russia has started from the military and mobilization plays a huge part in that. Of course regime changes often start from the military. In most countries they have the monopoly on violence. But personally I don't think that mobilization is a problem for Russia. They already have conscription meant for that exact scenario. I would say that it's military defeats that increase and multiply already existing social unrest. The 1905 revolution was partly a response to the humiliating defeat of Russia against Japan, which was considered to be a third world nation by Europeans. The 1917 revolution was a direct result of Russia's humiliating setbacks on the Eastern Front during World War I. By the end of 1914, only five months into the war, around 390,000 Russians had lost their lives and nearly one million were wounded. As a response, Tsar Nicholas II took personal control of the army in 1915. He left St. Petersburg and moved his headquarters to Russian Poland. Problem is, things got even worse. By the end of October 1916, Russia had lost between 1.6 and 1.8 million soldiers as KIA with an additional 2 million prisoners of war and multiple millions of wounded. And since he was commander-in-chief, the Tsar was blamed and even scapegoated for all these defeats. And the Russian population was simply unhappy with his regime. As for the Soviet Union, the failure of the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan really undermined the legitimacy of the Soviet government especially since a lot of the troops sent abroad were young, untrained conscripts. And all this was aggravated when people knew that the Soviet government had camouflaged a lot of its losses in Afghanistan. Lastly, the Russian defeat and withdrawal during the First Chechen War was humiliating and made President Yeltsin look really bad. And Russians had lost faith in his government. And shortly after, he was replaced by Putin. What I'm trying to say is that if Putin knows Russian history, he knows everything I just told you. That's why he constantly tries to distance himself from military operations, so as not to be directly blamed for military setbacks. And to avoid an Afghan and Chechen scenario, he really prefers to send volunteers to the front instead of conscripts. But ultimately, he knows that if he loses the war in Ukraine, his days are counted. Hi and welcome to History Legends, here are the latest news about the Russo-Ukrainian war. Here we cut the BS and talk about what the media doesn't tell you. As always, information changes by the hour, so if you have any new information, just comment it below. If you're new to this channel, make sure to check out my Ukraine playlist so you don't miss anything I've said in the past. And as you know, just like with many other commentators, 
a lot of my videos have been targeted with limited or no ads. So make sure to subscribe to my Patreon or PayPal to keep the show running. Huge thanks to all of you that have already helped and welcome to the headquarters. This means a lot, a lot of fresh cannon fodder for Russia, but no highly motivated, highly trained troops for Russia. Cannon fodder? I don't understand, you said it yourself. These men are reservists. They already went through military training and should get further training to refresh their skills. Logically, they won't be completely clueless on the battlefield. And it's not as if Russia will make a new army out of these mobilized men. I'm pretty sure they will act as replacements for already existing units manned by experienced fighters. Essentially, they will plug the gaps. It's true that some Russians are unhappy to be sent to the front. But the media won't show you the ones that seem to be accepting their duty with pride. Here are mobilized men from Karachay, Cherkassia celebrating their departure to the front. Osetians embarking in aircraft going to the front as well. Families saying goodbye to their loved ones at a bus station in Yekaterinburg. And here at a train station in Yarkutsk. And we often hear the case of unmotivated Russian conscripts. And there's a case for it. Being a Russian conscript sucks unless you like to be beaten by a 30 IQ Siberian bear. Russian YouTuber NFKRZ, Roman, our favorite neighborhood Russian. He literally explained in his older videos how he avoided the draft in January 2021. Which, by the way, really made him dodge a Ukrainian bullet. Or rather, javelin missile. However, I had a plan, I was not dumb. Basically, I just read a lot of uh, information about it, the way it's supposed to be done. Essentially, I came prepared with all of my medical documents, made copies of them and everything, stuff like that. I came in with a full list saying, hey guys, check me out, I have asthma, you know, you can't do anything with me. In like rural Russia, you can buy or bribe, uh, you know, like the military draft office for uh, like 100 to 150,000 rubles. And I've heard of some uh, going up to like 300,000, so like 200,000 in Moscow. From what he said, there are a lot of ways a Russian can avoid military service. Correct me if I'm wrong, but from my understanding, the guys that really don't want to join the Russian army won't. The Russian military even has a nickname for them, grammatical conscripts. It's said that a grammatical conscript becomes a headache for the military registration office. Men who know their rights under the law. <laughs> and eventually they leave him alone and find someone else to take his place. I don't know, I find it hilarious. So most educated young guys from big cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg, because they know the tricks, will tend to be able to avoid the draft. So logically, the Russian army will tend to focus its recruitment on poor, less educated districts of the country. In the end, the Institute for the Study of War estimates that 1.2 million men are eligible to be drafted each year but only about 400,000 actually end up serving, so one in three. But despite that, it will have an effect on the battlefields. This will be a huge obstacle for Ukraine, and I'm sure they're preparing for the arrival of these new troops. If this war has proven something, is that manpower is still important. According to the Minister of Defense of Ukraine, Oleksiy Reznikov, about a million Ukrainians are currently involved in the work of the defense. That's huge! Think about it, when was the last time in Europe that a country fielded 1 million men? Compared to that, Russia has roughly 200,000 men on the front, maybe 300,000, among which a significant number are Wagner mercenaries and militiamen from Luhansk and Donetsk. It's clearly not enough to hold a 1,000 km front line. Mathematically, Ukraine has an advantage of 5 to 1. Every morning I wake up, look at the news, and there's a new Ukraine breakthrough. And Russian forces don't seem to be able to stop them. Now, if Russia gets 300,000 additional reservists, I say if, because this requires proper organization and logistics, which the Russians seem to have trouble with at the moment. With that extra 300k, the ratio of forces drops to 2 to one. And Arthur is right, this is only the first wave of mobilization. Another one could be called up. If we're talking about another 300,000, the ratio could drop to 1.25 to 1. Almost parity. This is a thing he forgot to mention. As of now, according to Russian law, it is illegal for Putin to deploy conscripts outside of Russia. So although the Russian armed forces are huge, one-year conscripts form a large part of it, and sometimes as high as 50% of the total strength. 
and they can't officially be used. When the State Duma will sign documents that occupied territories are officially part of Russia, conscripts will be allowed to be sent in southern Ukraine and in the Donbass. We're talking about an additional 200,000 to 400,000 troops. Russia simply has to copy paste what Ukraine did. These conscripts don't have to be storming enemy positions on day one. They can guard supply routes or simply build trenches and plug the gaps. And once again, I doubt that a formation of 1,000 conscripts will be launched on a frontal assault and act like cannon fodder. But if Russia decides to mix these inexperienced conscripts with battle-hardened veterans, then overall they could have pretty decent formations. But the thing is, by now, a lot of these Ukraine conscripts we talked about for a month are also now battle-hardened veterans. So qualitatively, the Ukraine army now is better than the Russian one. They have a numerical advantage and a qualitative advantage. There's also apparently the Russian PMC Wagner that recruited 1,500 people from prisons. For example, here's the picture of Igor Kusk, sentenced to 23 years in prison for murder and leading a criminal organization. At age 55, he volunteered with Wagner and died from a shrapnel wound in Bakhmut. He was buried with honors in his hometown. Fun fact, the French Foreign Legion accepts former prisoners, except those convicted of rape, blood crimes, and drug trafficking. Wagner could also be recruiting Belarusian military personnel. Who knows? Lastly, Kadyrov said that every one of Russia's 85 regions should send at least 1,000 volunteers to the front. Ideally, 2,000. That would mean an extra 85k to 170,000. So let's summarize. 200k from the SMO, 300k reservists, 200k conscripts, plus an extra 85k volunteers equals an extra 585,000 for a total of 785,000 troops within a couple months, perhaps by winter. But with the current rate of the Ukraine offensive, like we said earlier, it might be too little too late. So this is why many people think that Russia will just rush these men without trading to the front. Maybe. I mean, it worked for Ukraine. There were unconfirmed reports that after 11.59 p.m. it will be illegal for military-aged men aged between 18 to 65 to leave Russia. This is unconfirmed, but in the light of mobilization, I would imagine that a lot of Russia's young male population would try to leave the country. He's right, a lot of Russians have left the country. But we cannot ignore the fact that something similar happened in Ukraine. On the 3rd of March 2022, all male Ukrainian citizens aged 18 to 60 were prohibited from traveling abroad. How many escaped before this was announced? How many were arrested by Ukraine border agents? Only thing is that Russia's border is much, much bigger than Ukraine's. So it's also much easier for people to escape abroad. Just watch my own videos, but it seems a lot of people have forgotten that Ukraine went through seven waves of mobilization. How many Ukraine conscripts were sent to the front with less than three days of training? Tens of thousands, if not more. And even in Ukraine, there were some rebellions against these mobilizations. So even if conscripts are reluctant, they don't want to go to the front. They have this social pressure to go. This is a duty against a historical enemy. Fun fact, during the Vietnam War, 210,000 Americans were accused of draft offenses. And it is estimated that 60,000 to 100,000 left the US, mainly for Canada. But then thousands of Canadians also volunteered for the Vietnam War, so it kind of leveled out. I mean, this is Russia. They're known for their illogical decisions where to attack. That's funny because German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck reportedly said, never fight with Russian. On your every stratagem, they answer unpredictable stupidity. To be honest, I don't even know if he actually said that. But what's true is that during World War II, the Germans were absolutely shocked at how unpredictable the Soviets were. The Germans reported that sometimes the Soviets would fight for useless positions with fanatic conviction and extreme bravery. Other times they could abandon a successful assault because of unexplained sudden fear and terror. I think I did a video about it a long time ago. Once again, he's right. The most logical thing for Moscow to do would be to reinforce the front line. And I think this is the objective of adding 300,000 men with already existing skills to the front. Thing is, the process will take approximately two months to fully materialize on a battlefield. This is why we can believe that Russian commanders project themselves for the winter season already. 
Logistically speaking, it also doesn't make sense for the Russians to spread out their forces. They tried this last year in February and it was a nightmare, a disaster. It would make more sense to deploy these men on already existing supply lines. Ukraine knows this and this is probably the reason why they keep attacking now by gaining as much ground as possible. There's no reason to wait because later will become much harder. All of these decisions would be really stupid because Russian fronts right now are crumbling. The first thing to do would be to reinforce these fronts. From a military perspective, this would be the wisest thing to do. But, but like Arthur Rehi said, the Russians are known for their unpredictable military decisions. And we know that the best defense is offense. To me personally, if Russia had indeed offensive capabilities, an attack against Zaporozhye could be considered. As you can see, the front is not too far from the city itself. We're talking about less than 30 kilometers. And if the Russians manage to gather a lot of troops here that simply push forward along this line, this puts the city of Zaporozhye in great danger. But this could also create a new bridgehead over the Dnieper. Russians could also keep pushing forward towards Dnieper and Pavlorad and hold the center of Ukraine and yet another bridgehead and control the rear and supply lines for these men here. Let's take a look from a higher angle, Zaporozhye Dniepro. An attack like this. If the Russians controlled this area, it would be really bad for the Ukrainians. Because to supply all the Ukrainian forces in this sector, they could only go through Poltava and Kharkiv. And Kharkiv itself is also very close to the Russian border. Let me know in the comment section, what do you think Russia could attack? Again, this here is the only part that Russians are actively pushing right now, so maybe they would just try to push stronger. It certainly wasn't the wisest decision to attack a more numerous enemy on strengthened positions. But I think they did so because of poor command and control. It became apparent that Russian commanders cannot coordinate huge flanking maneuvers. And they don't have the logistics for it either. So simple head-on attacks, it is. Even if it's a slow process, it's the easiest. But for this to be somewhat effective, you need at least some numerical advantage. So this mobilization will not give any upper hand to Russia. It might only even out the cards. But like I mentioned earlier, if properly organized, and if they have the political will, Russia could easily bring that extra 500,000 men that Arthur was talking about. 